Welcome to the Realm Cast. I am your host, the Mortal Kombat Phantom, and with me as always is my co-host, our lore master, Yanni. Welcome, Yanni. Thanks, Phantom. And today we'd like to welcome Catalin, who played uh, not just Katana, but also Melina and Jade in Mortal Kombat 2, the uh, video game, back when they used to do the live action pictures and stuff. So Catalin, it's, it's great to have you on the episode today. Welcome. Thanks for inviting me. So before we kind of jump into your history with you know, actually being in the video game, what was your life kind of going into this? How did you get involved with Mortal Kombat in the first place? Uh, some of it was being in the right place at the right time with a lot of the right um, special, I guess, skill sets. Uh, and then there was just a lot of great um, coincidences that surrounded my involvement in the game. Uh, I had just graduated college. I was a martial artist leading up to this and Danny had remembered me from when I was a competitor before college. He had seen me compete probably a dozen times, uh, coincidentally, cause it's a small world, you know, in, in certain sports circles. And we were, I was training at a health club where he actually worked and he taught. And he had met my mom at a separate occasion and my brother in a separate occasion. So there, there were all these things that kind of just led to me kind of meeting the guys and the guys meeting uh, a female martial artist. Uh, they had decided after MK1 that they were going to go with a martial arts female um, to, to play the role of, you know, this character that they, that John Tobias had created, uh, but didn't really know what she was going to be able to do. Uh, they knew what they wanted as a wish list. Uh, they didn't want to be restricted to what the character's capabilities and skills would be. They basically wanted someone female that kind of matched the same capabilities of like Ho Sung and Danny. And I had that background. Had you heard about Mortal Kombat before all of this, or was that yeah. your introduction? Well, I mean, I had heard about it because my brother was um, just so into the game. Mm. So uh, one of or one of my brothers was really, really into the game. So I heard about it through him. Uh, but certainly I knew arcade games. Was he the one who actually put you in touch, or was it Danny? Because I know that there's yeah. a story around... Oh, yeah? Uh-huh. So... Yeah. So what's funny is my brother was, is a pretty social guy. And the truth is that Danny was just, he was a really outgoing, great guy. And he just would talk to everybody. And once my one brother found out that this guy, Danny, who worked at the club that he was a member at, my brother, I think played basketball there or something like that. And my mom worked out there that um, Danny was in the game. And my brother was just, you know, probably, the first person in his fan club. Uh, so, and the proximity to Danny was very close, if that makes sense. Like mm-hmm. Danny worked there. They went to the club a few times a week. Mortal Kombat was, you know, coming was out. My brother played the game and he said, you should meet my sister. You really got to meet my sister. And Danny would be like, yeah, 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 kid. You know, whatever. He, no, really, my sister's really a black belt. She's really, she's really this person who could do this. Yeah, 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 kid. But then it just never clicked that this was this person that he was talking about and that I was that person that he thought about and that I was that person that was in the gym working out. And then all of a sudden there was a day, I think, that we all walked in together. Like I had just come home from college. And I, I think my mom was signing me up to be on the family membership. And like Danny was at the front desk. It was like one of those moments where it just kind of took a second. And that's why I say that certainly I was at the right place at the right time, but I also had the right abilities and there were all these other coincidences. So then when jo- uh, Danny kind of like put it all together, you know, John then came and met me and then they explained it to me and I was like, okay. And I had done enough um, modeling um, because my dad was, uh, was a commercial photographer. So I wasn't like a model model, but I was like, you know, good enough for like when you need that extra person for something. So I was familiar with shooting. I had gymnastics as a background. 
Um, so it was just like the right combination skills. And I had just like gotten my black belt also in Taekwondo. So my kicks were pretty solid, you know, on top of, I had my black belt in karate. So, and I was already in another karate program. So there were just all these things that I had been boxing and kickboxing in college. So it was just a good combination of everything all at one time. Let's let's talk a little bit more about your experience with martial arts because you've been in it since like 1982. Is that right? I was nine, so 1980. Oh, really? So that, yeah. that, like, that's when you started. Gosh, like, and you've and so, and so you said you around this time you had a black belt in karate and taekwondo also. Yeah, by the time I was like 22, I, I had two two black belts, I think. And then do you, think you've so. done other things too. Of I've I've heard like uh, kung fu. Yes. So when I met the whole crew and the gang, uh, we obviously all clicked. And then it just gave you just, you know, when you're young and you're out of college, even though you're working and then maybe I was going to graduate school, you, and I had just gotten hired. That's right. So I had just gotten hired at that time to uh, be the kickboxing and boxing coach at the East Bank Club. That was like my first big job out of college. And I took that job. Um, as a way to keep training and practicing, but I was also starting graduate school. So when you're that age, you have nothing but time. <laughs> you know what I mean? You could work a full day and then go back to the gym at nine o'clock. And it was kind of funny because Ho Sung loved to train at night. And once I was in school and once I was working, I didn't have as much time to train um, during the day. Or I had like this weird middle of the day time to train. You would go to school and then maybe you'd have nothing from like one to three. And then you'd go to school and work again. And then you'd get home at like eight o'clock. And I would go meet up actually with Ho Sung most of the time. And Ho Sung and I would train. And he actually was the one who taught me uh, Kung Fu and Wushu. Um, yeah. So that's when I started that. And then I got into jujitsu. And that whole gang was like, what are you doing, jujitsu? They were like really not into it <laughs> at the time. They were just not big fans, you know, because they were traditional martial artists and I got it, you know, but I was really into the combat stuff as well. And I was just one of these people that always thought like, why can't I do all of it? You know, what's the big deal? Mm -hmm. So, yeah. So you went through Wushu? But Ho Sung is really where I got most of my Kung Fu and Wushu training. Danny gave me a lot of foundation for sure. And then I got a lot of training later on, years later, from a woman who we, I believe actually, it's a, I, I can't remember if Ho Sung met her first or Ho Young, his brother. Her name was Zhong Wei. She was. A uh, the gold medalist from China on the Wushu team. She ended up coming and immigrating to America and then worked for Ho Young at Ho Young School. So I had like Danny, Ho Sung, Ho Young, and this woman over like a four or five year span teaching me Kung Fu and Wushu. Yeah, so it was pretty lucky. And, and it came actually very easy to me because I had the rest of the martial arts background and I had the dance background and I had the martial or the gymnastics. Those of our fans who, you know, don't know the details of, of Mortal Kombat. Um, Ho Sung is actually the actor who played Luke Kang and Danny being Daniel Pacina, who played uh, Scorpion, Sub-Zero and Johnny Cage in, in the yeah. series. Just to clarify and, that. Yeah, and a couple others. But yeah, but those are his main characters. I mean, you've mentioned what seems to be like uh, Wushu, Jiu Jitsu. Karate, Taekwondo, another, I think another type of karate, if I'm correct. Kung Fu. Yeah, I have a Japanese and an Okinawan karate black belt. Cool. Wow. That's awesome. Wow. <laughs> the real life katana. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, my first black belt took the longest, mm -hmm. as it should, because I started as a child, and it should take that long. Mm -hmm. So then the second one was pretty fast. The second and, yeah, those were much faster. The second karate and the Taekwondo did not take me very long. This is giving me such kind of 80s throwback vibes because uh, Karate Kid studied Okinawan karate. And so it, mm -hmm. it's cool to hear, you know, that yeah. about other people actually learning that uh, yeah. particular technique. So that's cool. Yep. Okinawan karate was probably 
Yeah. I mean, that, yeah. I mean, I, Okinawan karate for sure is something that was my first dedicated art form. That's cool. So uh, you're coming to us today from your, your actual gym and yep. We know that you're you're very fit, fitness focused, uh, and that you have your your own training center and all these articles about you. Um, so, what was it like, kind of, you know, coming from your 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 previous history? Because you you actually ended up getting a degree in anthropology and forensics, didn't you? Mm-hmm. I did. I thought I was going to be uh, working in law enforcement was my original thought, but. You know, you got to put it in the context of like the 80s and the 90s that, you know, women were not professional coaches and women were not, um, uh, women just didn't have as many opportunities. So I never pursued that. Had I known, uh, I would have probably pursued something in the exercise sciences just because it's clearly the industry that, or even a business degree which I just never even thought about that when I was younger. But, Mm -hmm. um, you know, it came to a crossroads when I was in graduate school. I had applied to the Illinois State Police Department and um, I had been accepted. And at the same time, I was working at East Bank and I was doing so well. I was I had so many clients. I was teaching. I was having a blast. I was in this fitness environment where, you know, there was just a lot of opportunity there. There was a lot of opportunity to grow as uh, in your education. And I just kind of took advantage of everything. So I basically kind of had this like crossroads where I hit and it was time to decide if I was going to go down the path of law enforcement. And I always knew that in order to kind of work your way into kind of a crime scene, or that kind of realm, you you had to start off as a police officer, you know, which is what I thought I was going to do. And then my goal was to use my degree and hopefully move into other areas of law enforcement, particularly forensics. And at that time, Illinois had just invested in building, it's not new now, it was new, new then, a brand new Illinois State Crime Lab. So that was my vision, you know, like, okay, I'm going to put my time in, I'm going to get my degree, I'm going to be good at my job. And then when this crime lab is done, I'm going to try to apply and cross over to the other side after. But I always knew that I wanted to be in law enforcement because I felt that it was really important if I was going to do anything crime scene or lab tech or anything in that realm that I knew what the other side and the work was like. Got it? Mm -hmm. So that was like, I was just really laser focused on that. and then. I was talking to my mom and I was like, wow, mom, I'm making this much money right now. You know, I was like, God, you know, what should I do? She's like, well, you know, what do you enjoy more? And so we just started talking and I was like, well, wouldn't it be cool if I could just do martial arts for the rest of my life? She goes, well, that's kind of what you're doing right now. Yeah. You know? So I was like, I think it was like $35,000. I'm just going to make that up. It was like, Start as a police officer at $35,000 or keep making $35,000 doing what I'm doing where I've got like total control. I train all the time. You know, my life is kind of my own and I love this place, which was called the East Bay Club. I loved working there and I was doing really, really well. And, and I had like this great life and it's like, I, I got up, I went to work, I taught martial arts and some fitness classes and then I had a break and then I did martial arts and worked out and then I taught martial arts and then I went and to my jujitsu school and then after jujitsu school, I'd go meet Ho Song back at the health club and we'd play basketball and, you know, and like that was like this life and it was like great and it was super fun. And I got to travel, whereas, you know, going into the law enforcement, your life's very fixed, Mm. very regimented. You know, your life is no longer your own. It really doesn't belong to you, you know, once you're a police officer. It it belongs to your community and and everything like that. And, you know, I just took the right path, I guess. Yeah, really. I mean, it sounds like you're you're having more fun than (laughs) you would have been an officer. Yes, I think so. It yeah. sounds like you, you chose the sort of the physical path, right? But 
on the other hand, like it's not just physical, is it? If I understand correctly, you've also released a lot of your own articles and such. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I've had, I always say, and I've always been very, very honest about it. I feel like I've had the most prolific martial artist career. I've dabbled in a little bit of professional stunt work. I've done a little bit of film, video game, choreography, fight scene. I've done live performances. I've been a competitor. I've trained. I've written. I've covered fights. I've been in videos. You know, so I've really, I mean, there's just not a thing that I would say I wish I would have done uh, that's related to martial arts you know, maybe a little bit of more of everything else. But then at that point, I just feel like I'm getting greedy because I've got <laughs> so much, you know. Um, but I think the thing that I really worked the hardest for, to be quite honest, is when I was a writer and covering um, fights in, in for the magazines and also, you know, certainly the acquisition of knowledge was not easy. I mean, Danny and Hosung made it easy. But boxing, jujitsu, all that stuff was a little bit harder path, you know. Um, it was not a very welcoming environment. That was like something I always did kind of in secret, you know, because women were not really um, welcome in those circles back then. Uh, you have to remember, I'm 50. So, no, you know, you. 30 years ago, women were not really like they are now. Mm. Like now you have fight promoters where they do anything to get female Mm-hmm. Um, matches on their cards. Well, I was no, going to say, it, what, how's that change? Yeah. How, what's that sort of shift exactly based on your experience then? Yeah, I think a crossroads happened with, you know, for me, I definitely pursue the combat and submission arts both uh, at the same time. Well, no, I started boxing sooner. I started boxing when I was like 18, 17, something like that. And I can remember going to park districts, learning, wanting to learn to box here and them just laughing at me and not eat, like they would not, would not let you uh, train. So I, when I got to college, actually I haven't thought about this in a long time. So I, I went to University of Illinois, Champaign-Urbana and I was there with my mom and I was on a tour of the campus and they had this building called IMPI, which was the athletic training center. and they had a combat room, which really looked looked like nothing other than a clean, large, open space with matted floors, matted walls, and then a portion of it was hardwood floors. So it was like beautiful, didn't have a ton of equipment, and it had bags, a seed bag, and mirrors. And there was a guy from Argentina shadow boxing. And I went up to him and asked him if he taught boxing. And he, he, he said, you wanted to learn to box? And I said, yeah, I want to learn to box. Now, mind you, my dad was a boxer. So um, I used to go watch my dad train when I was younger, coincidentally. But obviously, like, impressions like that stick with you for your whole life, you know, just marveling at, like, your father. My father had me when he was pretty young. So he was really young when... You know, like when I I was at my dad's 30th birthday party, like I remember my dad's 30th birthday party. That's how young my dad was. So this guy just like, I said, mom, do you mind if I work out for a little bit? And he's like, what do you do? And I said, I do karate. And he was like, oh, show me. And at the time I was a forms competitor. So I like showed him my form. And he's like, okay, well, you know, and we just started talking and he started teaching me to box. And that was that. And it was over. Like, I was in heaven. All I wanted to do was learn to box. And I had just, not super recently, but previously recently to that moment in time, I had quit karate. It was like, I want to quit. I want to box. I want to do something that's like, you know, I think tough. Like, I don't know what I wanted, but that's what I wanted to do. Yeah, so that's when I started, and then I got into kickboxing through college, and then started teaching karate on the side, then signed up at a Taekwondo school outside of the school, got my black belt there, busted through that really, really fast, and because I was like stuck there for the summer or something, 
And uh, yeah, so that's kind of like, it just started all happening. It was just like one of these things I did. It when I went to Taekwondo, I never told them that I was boxing. And, you know, when I started, you know, the jujitsu, I actually kind of hid it from Danny and the guys, you know, because they were not really big fans at the time. And it, it was just kind of a weird time. You know, martial artists just didn't cross over. Yeah. You know, very much. Shao, uh, Shaolin Kung Fu to Wushu, there was crossover there. Mm-hmm. It would be acceptable to do like judo and like kendo, but there wasn't like, you know, you wouldn't cross state lines kind of Right. Thing, like you know? the Chinese martial arts would stay with the Chinese martial arts, uh, Japanese with Japanese, that sort of thing. Right. Like maybe you would pick up Wing Chun and Kung Fu or you would mm-hmm. do Bagua mm-hmm. and Tai Chi. Uh, taekwondo. Well, they pretty much just let you do maybe a keto. Yeah, you know, I mean, it just wasn't yeah. like that in the 80s and the 90s. 70s, 80s, and 90s was not that way. It wasn't a very reciprocating community. Danny was a very knowledgeable person. That was the one thing that I always liked was that Danny was like super knowledgeable about all the different factions of martial arts and all like the internal orders and the story and the history. And he just had a real good knack for it. And he had an amazing memory for it, you know. So I always looked up to Danny in that way. And I was like, I'm going to, you know, like inside, I probably never told Danny that, but I was like, I'm going to be like that, but with like all the combat sports, mm-hmm. you know, because I wanted the stuff that was like the tougher stuff. <laughs> Did the uh, forensics ever come back into play at all in your life? Like affect you no. at all? <laughs> no, it didn't. You know, I mean, I don't regret it because, you know, there's a certain level of critical thinking that you mm-hmm. gain with a major like that. It's a very, you know, you know, it, it dissect and then put back together. You know, there's certainly a, a way of thinking about information that I think comes with a major like that. And it was a very um, sociologically savvy perspective on the world, you know, because you have to learn so much of that. I mean, I loved graduate school. I mean, graduate school taught me how to learn about things mm. I really want to learn about. And I think that's why I was able to fast track becoming, you know, pretty knowledgeable within the exercise sciences and starting to write and present and then going on to to do a bunch of exercise videos. And then I went on to write a ton of manuals, training manuals for fitness companies, you know, things like that. I became a very good technical writer. Did you expect that you would be writing like when you started, when you, when you made this Mm -hmm. different career choice? (laughs) No, Mm -mm. technical writing did come easy to me. And I, I think that has a lot to do with the forensics because we had so much, um, I don't know. I just had a really good knack for like biomechanics. Another thing I bet you didn't expect was eventually becoming an actress because a lot of fans know that you actually played in uh, the Book of Swords movie alongside of uh, Ho Sung and uh, Daniel Pacina and even uh, Richard Divizio, who played Kano in the original games. So, sure. I mean, let's just be really clear, though. I mean, actress is a stretch. I was, <laughs> <laughs> I was a fighter in, in the film. I didn't really have lines. And it was like one of those things where I really didn't want any lines, which was mm-hmm. interesting because at that time, I was doing exercise videos already and presenting, but, um, you know, the fight stuff and the choreography and the stunt work, that was super fun, but I wouldn't call myself like an actress. I mean, I guess we're called actors in the game because it's still us physically doing it and we did it, but not, not from a, you know, a voice acting perspective. It's cool because a lot of the hardcore uh, fans really remember that movie still. And like anytime we we start talking about, you know, some of you guys, th- people always want to know about that movie. Like, what was your experience like actually playing in it? Just I mean, besides, of course, the, the fighting aspect of it, like w- what was the fun behind the scenes and that sort of thing? Or was it just oh, like, yeah, it was yeah. fun. <laughs> but that, the one thing I remember is we were so cold. We shot outside more than we shot inside and it was just freezing Every, was that filmed was in chicago cold. yeah it was always oh. cold it was always miserable weather uh which made for good background like that was what the script setting 
called mm-hmm. for was miserable, dreary, like you couldn't light it that way. It was just dreary naturally. The weather was so bad. I just remember being unbelievably cold all the time. And that was my biggest concern is I don't do well and I'm not fast when I'm cold. Oh yeah. At all. Like I have to be really, really, really hot and warmed up. Mm-hmm. And I remember it was a horribly cold day for my fight scene. And they wanted me to use my real size, which were my size from competition, which were the size I used to film the game. And I was really naturally fast with them. And a prop size, because they wanted me to twirl them, they don't twirl so well because there's a weight and the way mm. it's counterbalanced so that when you spin it, it has a balance. And the truth is I wasn't good with the props. I was slow. I was clumsy. I couldn't figure out how to do anything other than like stab, block, move. I couldn't do anything fun, fast, and fancy. And the sides were so cold oh, God. because it was freezing outside. Um, so yeah, we... It, it was, it was, it was all fun. It's certainly stuff that, you know, when you're young, once again, you have the, the energy, but I ended up spending more time producing on that film, more that like back of the house logistics. Mm-hmm. And, you know, even for like Hosung, you know, where I had more fun uh, is for all the fight scenes and all the acting things he had to do. I was his training partner that was fun yeah. because there's no pressure. Right. So here I am, I get to practice and go through things he's going to do for a film and audition for that movie. Uh, when he was in that show, um, masters on Fox, Mm -hmm. uh, I was on the other side, but no consequences for doing anything wrong. So it's like, I just got all the training out of it. And that I think really made me very good and very diverse yet I didn't have to be in the limelight at all, which I thought was really kind of the best of everything. Before we move into more, we're going into more detail on the actual Mortal Kombat game itself and your experience with it. You were also involved in another game alongside Hosea. Yeah. Atari. Uh, yeah. Was it <laughs> Thea Realm Fighters? I don't know how to say it. Thea what was Realm it? Fighters. Yeah. It was called Thea Realm Fighters. It was a game that actually Ho Sung, I believe, was the, not the executive producer, but it was his game concept and a couple other people. And obviously the idea was to use the martial arts staff from Mortal Kombat and take the level of the character's martial arts skill set to a little bit higher level. Okay. So keep in mind that By the time that game started to get scripted and put down on paper, the technology had already improved. Mm -hmm. After MK2 came out, you know, we were, I'm making these numbers up. It was 28 frames uh, a second, and then it went Mm -hmm. to more frames, you know. So because the technology was already improving and they, the world of gaming, the gamer world learned so much out of the tech ed and John had created the next generation or the next evolution of that, the games got better and the movements became more um, dynamic. We were able to basically do more things because we didn't have to do it in slow motion. Whereas when we filmed Mortal Kombat, we had to do everything in slow motion because it couldn't capture us. We were too fast. Yeah, most of us. Like, I know everything I was doing was way too fast. Um, And then when you add things like jumping, um, uh, uh, flip-flops, walkovers, uh, falling, spinning, you had to do it so slow so the movements were less dynamic than they were when the technology could capture you at a faster speed. Does that make sense? Yeah. So That's that makes why, sense like, with a lot of the when poses. You look at, yeah, I think I think it's uh, Liz Sonia's character, or Liz's character Sonia, uh, or the Sonia character. I think she doesn't she do like a spin kick, like a spinning outside crescent kick or something. 
Oh, and in, in, in Mortal, Mortal Kombat two, there was a no wait. I guess that was three. There's no, a bicycle. Thing. Was three. One or three. Well, you you can see on some of the spin kicks that they're not as nice looking hmm. as some of the just straight up kicks because you would have to spin and then kick as mm-hmm. opposed to like capture the kick coming out as you're spinning. Does that make sense? Okay, yes. Yeah. It would be like you would twirl. So it would be like twirl around and then kick, mm-hmm. you know what yeah. I mean? As opposed to twirl and kick, you know, yeah. Yeah. there were some things that we could do with the Atari tech that was just a little bit cooler. And obviously we learned so much through the first two games, especially Danny and Hosung, because they were in both. And they had such a big part. Danny has such a big role in everything that happened on the choreography side in leading the rest of us. Um, that when we got to Theo Realm Fighters, we were able to do just a lot. And we, you know, you have so many more ideas. You learn from experience and then it gets better. So with Theo Realm Fighters, I think I was like three characters or something. You know, it was like a military character. I was some princess of some kind. And then I was going to be some sort of evil, rotten character, you know. But that game, they they made me do the princess in heels. (laughs) They didn't want to add it. How was that? It was fine. Yeah, you didn't have any problems with it? No, I mean, certainly it changes what you could do. But I could Mm -hmm. do still things like a back walk over. A mm-hmm. front kick, a side kick, a round kick, okay. punches, kicks, blocks. The jumping stuff was the harder stuff. So what you're saying is fighting in heels is not impossible. It's not impossible, <laughs> but I wouldn't recommend it. But it right. was <laughs> yeah. Take that unrealistic Mortal Kombat note. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, so um, what ended up happening to this game? Um, did it just, it just didn't make it into production? I think something, well, I think Atari... Uh, folded right in an Atari. Oh, yeah, yeah that's right. It was supposed to be the game that brought them out of their peril that they were going to release this on the Jaguar system. From what I remember, uh, we they launched it at um, God. What was the name of that show? Whatever was like the big electronic show, like mm, like E three or something like that. E three, yeah, exactly. Okay. Yeah. We launched it there, and I think there's footage online you can find from the show. Oh, wow. uh, cool. Yeah. Actually, I think I just posted something recently about it on maybe my, my Instagram. I can't remember. But in any case, you know, we launched it at the show, the Jaguar platform. And yeah, there is. There's actually something. It's on, I think, my Instagram. I found it recently. It is online. We were at the show, and I found somebody else filming us. It wasn't us. It was someone else filming us behind the stage, practicing our fight scene before we were going to go on stage and do a fight scene. That's cool. That's really cool. Yeah. Wow. And we all looked like 12 years old. (laughs) (laughs) It was like me, Philip, and Danny were there, I think. Yeah. Me, Philip, and Daddy. That must have been so cool to actually go back and say, I'm going to have to find this clip at some point then. But you also it's had, I think, really finishers. Old. Say again? You also had some finishers, I think, uh, uh, based on what I've read. Was that sort of like inspired from what your experience on in Mortal Kombat as well? Oh, I mean, without a doubt. They, they, they reproduced the best things about Mortal Kombat. I mean... I mean, I'm not putting anybody down that was on that project, but it wasn't like a, a new, unique concept. It was, mm-hmm. let's take something we've done and let's take do the further. martial arts better. And then, mm-hmm. you know, at the end of the day, that was, we were the group that they wouldn't, uh, that we we wanted to get paid for um, doing the next game. And there was all that like legal mess where they ended up selling the rights to our images based on our characters in the game to, you know, over 40 different companies for licensing and then never wanted to compensate any of the original actors for that. So there was that whole mess. So that's when, you know, Hosung and 
Danny and, you know, myself just kind of like broke off and said, you know, let's just do our own thing. Jaguar wants to pay us, you know, and, you know, unfortunately, Atari just didn't work out. Or not, uh, sorry, Atari wanted to pay us, but and but sadly, Jaguar didn't work out. Mm-hmm. The Jaguar system and their mm-hmm. comeback didn't work out, you know. That's that's interesting. So this all kind of came around the same time as that legal battle. And, and, yes. and so rather than signing up for Mortal Kombat 3, you guys went over to Atari for that, for this new game. Yes. And, and the truth is that, um, you know, it, and I, I feel, you know, I get it. You know, like at the time, it, it I see why. And remember, my relationship with everyone was new in that John, Tobias, and I were new friends. Ed Boone and I were new friends. Whereas mm-hmm. Danny and Hosung and those guys were friends with John for a lifetime, you know, since childhood. So while I feel like I was part of the gang, I wasn't a person that was um, I didn't have a history to feel like John owed me something. Mm-hmm. Does that make sense? Danny, on the other hand, you know, really, really helped John with the creation of this game, you know, and was a sounding board. And even though John was the mastermind, for sure, uh, Danny was the one in the closet <laughs> filming all the stuff, using his camcorder, you know, using his dad's equipment, uh, you know, curating who should do what and what character would do this. And this style of a martial artist does these kinds of moves. And he was the one that, you know, knew all that stuff um, and so forth. He was the energy. He was the one that was on set with us, kind of explaining to us what we needed to do. And yeah, I, I mean, I think, I think Danny got screwed. I think it's really not fair what they did to us when it wasn't a matter of um, paying us millions. It was a matter of just being fair. They made, they've made over a billion dollars on the brand and the franchise. And, you know, to now say, okay, well, we're just going to hire other models and actors to play your characters. And then they're going to do your moves that you created. I mean, sure, you can do that. I mean, they did. Doesn't mean it's right. Mm-hmm. You know, um, you know, the characters that went on to play all the other, um, or I'm sorry, the actors that went on to play all the characters that we played and we created, you know, they didn't create it. They're just literally the actors. Whereas I feel like we were the artists. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I mean, the the semantics of what we're called. I mean, when the katana and the Molina go on, and it's a new female that's basically being told how to use size and how to use fans. The character only had size and fans because of me. Was this not something that was sort of directed in terms of the weaponry choice and such, or not? I mean. They asked me, what weapons can you do? I said, these oh. are the weapons I can do. Okay. Yeah, they never even thought of size. I see. I think staff was one. And you brought your own size, right? Because the ones that you used for the uh, the movie, yes. it was the same ones? Yes. And wow. I actually practiced with my competition, or my competition fan, excuse me, my actual martial fan. Mm-hmm. But it was too small and not it wasn't able to be captured. So we had to actually go and get a decorative like Chinatown fan yeah. so that it had the right reflection because the fan you use when you do fans is not that big. It's much smaller, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. but John underst- understood the scaling of how the things had to scale and how the things had to be captured. And that's when we swapped it out with that silver fan that I used and I only used one fan, not two. Whereas uh-huh. in real life, it's really two, it's really two fans. Mm-hmm. Even though I have the movement where I have the two fans, I only used one fan 
because that didn't John would say, now. like, what would you do if you were done? Like, what would you do if you were finished? I would be like, well, I would go like this. You know, cool. if you wouldn't put two fans over your face like this, right? If you were, yeah. running, right? Because it would block your face. But you would, <laughs> you know, because there's all these things in martial arts that you do in forms mm-hmm. that are, the, you know, forms are a beautiful combination of practicing the utilization and skill of a weapon, but also displaying the art form mm-hmm. of the weapon. So both my characters, I feel, had a good combination of exactly that. Like, how would the fans be used? And a lot of the movements were movements taken literally from form. Mm-hmm. Like, well, mm-hmm. how would you hold your fan if you were throwing a kick in your form? You know, you would. How would you hold your size if you were if you were striking in your form? Does that make sense? Like, John didn't know that. Ed mm-hmm. didn't know that. I knew that because I had spent you know years doing it. So that's how it became, you know, the movements that were in the game. And, you know, no criticism of the girls that went on to play the characters later. At the end of the day, they didn't, they didn't know how to do that. Someone told them what to do. So, you know, Danny loves those stories that are just absolutely the ones that are the authentic creation of the movements. Because while John is brilliant and Ed, they, I mean, they deserve all the credit in the world for the creation of the game. I think that, you know, Bally's Midway and, and John and Ed, they can, they can try to downplay the involvement of the creation of the characters as much as they want, but the fans know that it's the movement and the style and the way we all move differently, yet all work together that really um, define who the characters are and everyone else is just just trying to impersonate take our place. It. Yeah, they're yeah. just impersonating it. And that's okay, hmm. right? Because that's the way a brand goes, right? Just like there's people impersonating characters today and that's fine, but you know, you're not gonna go to the cast of the current Mortal Kombat movie actors and give them credit for the move, but they deserve all the credit in the world for doing a great job which is their job. Their job is to be an actor, which is to impersonate mm-hmm. something that's an original. That's the way I look at it. It doesn't bother me that we're not in the movie. I'm mean, not an actor. Mm-hmm. I don't want to mm-hmm. be in the movie. You know, I mean, other, other, uh, some of the guys from Mortal Kombat would have liked to have been in the movie. I couldn't care less about it. I would have liked to have gone on and continued playing Katana and Melina, but I wasn't mm-hmm. going to do it at the expense of them just being able to make one million dollars to my fifty dollars. Mm-hmm. That's yeah. literally yeah. what we got paid. You know what I mean? It was like <laughs> we got paid fifty dollars. They got paid a million. You know, I mean, it, so it, it it was just so grossly unfair that they could have just been fair. Mm-hmm. Okay. And shame on them for not believing in the product that it was going to have the success that it did. You know, it's not a lot of. And even at the time when the, the whole lawsuit of Mortal Kombat 2, I'm sorry, Mortal Kombat 3 um, was happening, I mean, they had made m- mil- like millions and millions and millions and millions of dollars. It's not like mm-hmm. they made a million dollars. I mean, classic cards, Hasbro toys, um, I forget which shoe companies, T-shirts. I mean, they made millions and millions and millions, not to mention everything that they sold for the overseas right. It's just, it's a shame. It's a shame that they did that. And it is a shame that John got caught in the middle because what was he going to do? Like jeopardize his job and his opportunities to like stand up for us. I don't know. If it would have been nice if he did. I don't know if that's really realistic to put that on a 25, 26 year old guy who, you know, is it wasn't his work. It was when you work for a company, what you create is owned by the company. Mm-hmm. So I, I understand why the guys were just deeply wounded over the situation based on their history at the time. But I 100% understand why John had his hands tied. So really shame on the company mm-hmm. for doing what they did. Certainly us not being involved didn't hurt the franchise because look at where they are today. So, you know, in their mind, they probably look back and said, yep, we did the right thing because look at how much money we've made. 
well, what's the relationship like now? Like, have you actually been in touch at all since this lawsuit's taken place? Or is that just sort of the end of it now? I have no bad feelings, no negative sentiments about Ed or John whatsoever or Ed Vogel. None whatsoever. Danny, once again, has always been our ringleader. He's mm -hmm. the one that keeps in touch, knows where everybody's at. Um, and I think it's wonderful. You know, he's, he's, I have what we were joking, uh, this weekend. He's our Iron Man, you know, that I keeps the Avengers together for until he does it, I guess. Sorry, Danny, I'm not saying you're going to have an end, but you know what I'm saying? <laughs> he's just always been the guy that has, you know, kept us together and pulled us all and reeled us all back in. You know, he's the glue. Okay. As far as I'm concerned. I'm curious about, I mean, it depends how much I can sort of ask on this topic. I am just curious because I understand that the lawsuit was regarding the royalties. And as you said, you were expecting sort of fairness rather than like what they did wasn't wrong, but it was wrong at the same time. So would, does that sort of mean like in terms of, was there a contract signed at all? Was it more that you were just getting paid for your portrayal? Were you getting paid royalties? Yeah, so we signed a simple photography release form. Mm -hmm. We didn't sign a contract. So they use mm. like one of those standard photo release forms. Like, okay. you know, when you are in the background and they're going to take a photo of something where you release your rights to it. And unfortunately, you know, we were all extremely young and it's not like we had money, you know, mm -hmm. we, yeah, I mean, it was just, it was just a real shitty thing. And it's mm -hmm. just a shame. Because, you know, the funny thing is, if we had to do it all over again, we would. Yeah. I mean, I'm just being honest. I mean, I really, I can't speak for everybody else. Yeah. I don't mm -hmm. know if Ho Sung would. Uh, mm -hmm. I don't know if Ho Sung would. It's interesting that you signed a, a photo release, which basically, you know, kind of gives the rights to your, your appearance. Yeah, yeah. But mm -hmm. it doesn't necessarily give the rights to all the input that you guys had within the game and, and you, I mean, you're in a way you were kind of creators in your own right with mm -hmm. everything that happened. Yeah. I think that what would make us happy would be an acknowledgement that it was a true collaboration. Certain mm -hmm. characters were authentic collaborations between John Tobias and the person who played the character in addition to Johnny. I mean, in addition to Danny. Does that make mm -hmm. sense? Like yeah. my character was created for sure between me, John and Danny. Johnny Cage was created between John and Danny. Uh, Shang Tsung was created between John and Philip and Danny. Mm -hmm. You see what I mean? Yeah. Danny mm -hmm. was always in there. Ho Sung. I, I, I can't remember if Danny was there for Ho Sung's character. Uh, I think one, maybe not two. I can't mm -hmm. remember. But my point is, you know, that that is, whereas like the the people who played our characters in MK3, the character was created by John and me and Danny mm -hmm. being played by person so-and-so. Does that make sense? Yeah. So... I think the fact that they just never recognize, acknowledge the contributions that we made to the development of the characters. And we'll never know if the game would have done as well without that collaboration. We'll never know. Mm -hmm. They would have still existed, but they would not have had certain aspects to them that are now signature to what that character has become and possibly, possibly contributed to the popularity of the game. We, we just don't know. Did you have any information about uh, the characters you're going to be playing, Katana Molina, when you showed up on set? And like, yeah. Was there any ninja. background? Yeah, there was that... a ninja. I was a ninja for sure. I mm -hmm. was going to for sure be two ninjas. I never knew about Jade at the beginning. Okay. That was something mm -hmm. that we kind of picked up, you know, a little bit later. And mm -hmm. um, I had a drawing of the costume, uh, which was like a one-piece uh, bathing suit with a belt mm -hmm. and gloves and boots and 
that, you know, I remember John Tobias being very gracious and very respectful, asking me if I felt comfortable wearing that. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I will say John Tobias was so nice. All the guys were, you know, being like the female being added to this boys group. Not that Liz wasn't, obviously she was, but, you know, we then all of a sudden just started hanging out together because Mm -hmm. we had martial Mm -hmm. arts in common. Um, They treated Liz, from what I have heard from Liz, Liz was treated with just so much respect. And they treated me with so much respect. Like to the point where I remember like John and Danny being like, we can't just have her changing in a closet. You know, like they were really like, you got to give her the office. Like they Mm -hmm. were really thoughtful to the fact that, you know, there wasn't a changing room, you know, whereas they would like be on set and just be taking their clothes off and like putting their costume. What about this? And things like that. They didn't put me ever in situations like that. So I really have nothing but wonderful memories and wonderful sentiments and wonderful emotions about all the guys in Mortal Kombat, in particular, Johnny, uh, John Tobias, Ed, all of them. I really do. I mean, I would do it again in a heartbeat That's because cool. it was so much fun. And more importantly, I'm now bonded to these other guys for the last, you know, 30 years. Mm-hmm. You know, not that I'm not close with Rich or Philip or, or Colors, but we all have this thing that connects and ties us. And, you know, Danny's just always been like an, an anchor, you know, like, you know, he's, he's a comfort. He's a, he's a, you know, like a security blanket for me when it comes to a lot yeah. of things, Mortal Kombat. I, I just, I don't regret having these relationships and I don't need to see these guys on a regular basis in order for that relationship to exist. You knew that you were going to be playing two ninja and you didn't actually know about Jade. Now, as far as I understand, you had the one outfit, which was in blue and then it was then edited. Color changed it. Yeah. So Jade was actually a complete surprise to you. Yeah. Like on the set, Jade was something that he was like, okay, we're going to do this thing. And I was like, okay. I mean, it just was, everything was just really easy. That's the thing that I think people don't realize. Like coming up with choreography was easy for us. You know, and I'm not saying a person who was a fighter wouldn't have been able to do it. But when you're a form competitor, your arsenal of moves is just so vast and wide because you do form competitions all the time. And we all had all these forms competitions and this history, and they were a far, uh, Hosong was a far more accomplished forms competitor than any of us, especially me. You know, I was like, by the time they were in, I was already like quitting competition and I was getting into the combat art, you know? Mm-hmm. And it was funny because they were like, ah, that stuff, look at what we do. It's so much higher level, you know? So we always had like, we were just too busy, you know, uh, you know, teasing each other over different things. It just like, it was just different. You know, I, I mean, I, I don't, I don't know how to explain it. It just was. That bond kind of. and breathe martial arts. Yeah. I mean, I just got, I got nothing negative to say about it. For those who don't know, Jade actually started off as a secret character. Now, Reptile mm-hmm. was the first secret character as, as far as I understand in all of gaming. But I think Jade was one of the first, or if not possibly the first female secret character. I'm not 100% yes. sure of that. So I, that is, I, I'm 95% that's true. It's quite the, I mean, achievement, I would say. It, it's pretty cool to yeah. think about, isn't it? You know? <laughs> well, um, I remember, you know, them talking about wanting to do more for that. And then them saying, we don't have any more money for something. Okay. And, you know. That they won't pay for anything else. And, mm-hmm. you know, and it was never like something where I said, well, if you can't pay me, I can't come back. It was just like, you know, they were moving and fast tracking. And then there was a ton of momentum and John wanted to get the game out and wanted to make sure that it was, uh, met the deadline. And, you know, I can't remember all those details. They kind of come back to me in like little pieces, you know, uh, but 
you know, John Tobias had a great vision. He, he knew what he needed to get done. He knew what this version was going to be. I think we were already talking about MK3 while he was wrapping up MK2. And then, you know, Everything it all fell apart for us. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. With uh, Katana's character, I mean, you've kind of made it your own, it seems, because you, you show up as a, at different conventions and stuff, appearing as the original Katana. Do you uh, have a, a, a stronger bond with that character than the others, do you think? Uh, I think I just... It, it's funny, I should technically have a stronger bond with Melina because I was <laughs> much better size practitioner than I was a fan mm-hmm. practitioner, um, for sure. I mean, I won trophies with the size. I never won trophies with, you know, I never walked away with first places with the, with the fans. And truth be told, at the time, I was a Japanese stylist using a fan, and it's really a Chinese weapon, mm-hmm. which is mm-hmm. why, probably why I'm, I was probably better at the fan after Mortal Kombat because I ended up learning Kung Fu and then learned Chinese forms with the fan. Does that make sense? Whereas yeah, I yeah. was playing with the fan. Because I thought the fan was cool, not because it was a, a weapon that went with the style I practiced. Whereas the size was actually a weapon I won trophies with and competed with and was from my style. Because when you compete, you go up and you present who you are, what you're doing, what style you are, and then what weapon you're doing. That is like standard. You would like open say, judges, you know, my name is Catalan, blah, blah, blah. My style is Goju Ru. I'm presenting this form. My weapon today will be the size. May I have permission to begin? And then you would go. So I think at the time I played with the fans thinking like, oh, I'm just going to try to add a fan to a bunch of Japanese, you know, but like that was just me just being rebellious. There was no way I was ever going to do well with that. You just couldn't do stuff like that back then. And then I finally learned some real forms with the fan. I think probably from Danny. I think Danny maybe taught it to me. Uh, but I was really naturally good at the fan uh, because I liked it. It's like a kid picking up nunchucks, but doesn't know martial mm. arts. Like they can twirl the nunchucks really well, but they don't really know a form that goes with the nunchuck. Yeah. If that makes sense. So did you actually end up enjoying using the fans more than the Psy in the end? Uh, probably. I think though, to, so back to your question, I think I like Katana cause she's just a good character. I've always resonated more with the fact that she's considered a good guy. And, you know, Melina's not. Mm-hmm. I, I am curious, though. <clears throat> you said that Katana was your favorite of the three. Would you be saying as well that she's most likely your favorite Mortal Kombat character, too? Uh, I actually really like Johnny Cage. Hey, all right. He makes me laugh. <laughs> yeah. Johnny Cage just makes me, like, smile all the time. And I don't know if it's just because I know it's Danny and that, that expression of Johnny Cage on the side of the game. I mean, mm-hmm. that's just Danny. If you've ever hung out with Danny, that's what Danny looks like all the time. Oh yeah, <laughs> definitely. <laughs> He's such a, he cheeses it up all the time. <laughs> yeah. But uh, I, yeah, I, I mean, I like Katana the most. I, I think it's, I think my characters are really unique in comparison to other games that have female characters in it and what they do. So, mm-hmm. and it's not putting down Danny's character, Johnny Cage. I love Johnny Cage, but Johnny Cage is really an homage to Van Damme. And Luke Cage's yeah. character is really an homage to Bruce Lee. And Raiden's mm-hmm. character is really an homage to Big Trouble Little China. Whereas mm-hmm. my character is not an homage to anything. My character, like, there's no previous character or pop culture representation of a female ninja that fights with size or fights with a fan. And I think mm-hmm. that is unique. Um, I mean, obviously, Barack is very unique because that's, but from a female, you know, the other thing to keep in mind is like, you know, there weren't a lot of female characters. Yeah. And I think the fact that they made her overly Asian in other versions of the game was just trying too hard to not look like me and made her less unique because, hmm. wow, big surprise, a, you know, a Chinese female ninja with her hair up like this and like mm-hmm. really and her hair pulled back like it was just so unoriginal whereas mm-hmm. my character because john i remember him asking do you what do you want to do with your hair i said i want my hair down you know i don't want my hair pulled back mm-hmm. so my hair was down 
you know, yeah. I, and I remember saying, I want my hair down like Wonder Woman because Wonder Woman fights with her hair down. You know, That's she cool. doesn't pull her hair back because I'm such a huge Wonder Woman, like crazy fan. So I think my characters were extremely unique in that way. Mm -hmm. The fact that they're now like Chinese ninjas is not that unique. Yeah, it's like, a stereotype. It's, like, it's yeah. just a stereotype rendition of what a female ninja could be. And I think when fans find out that she's actually Latina, that's even cooler. So yeah. it's like yeah. we didn't have to be. It's like Johnny Cage was Mexican. Mm -hmm. You know, that's cool. Yeah. You know, he wasn't, um, you know, from Eastern Europe or right. he wasn't, you know, he is American, but he's a Mexican American. I think that makes it more interesting yeah. than just casting a really, um, you know, traditional white American with, you know, a structured jaw. But no, mm -hmm. he was a really handsome Mexican American guy with a structured jaw. Why can't he be, <laughs> you know, Johnny Cage can be that. Yeah. You know, he doesn't have to be, you know, Johnny Consuela. It could be Johnny Cage, the Mexican-American fighter. You know, so yeah. I think those are some of the cooler things. I've, I've never thought about it like that. Yeah. it's That's that's an amazing outtake on it. I love that, actually. <laughs> we do have to ask you one last question before you go. What is your favorite finisher? Um, well, I would say it's the friendship move with baking the cake. Yeah. So, that was my yes. <laughs> so that's one of my favorites because they literally asked me, what would you do to your friend? And I said, and I bake, him a, bake him a cake. <laughs> <laughs> uh, is there anything you'd like to plug before we let you go? Yeah. Just, you know, you can follow me on Instagram. Um, it's uh, cattle and MK original and I can send it to you guys. Uh, my gym is pow gym, Chicago. And I can send you guys those handles for you to take a look at. Yeah, we'll, we'll put that in the description. Well, thank you. It's been a pleasure having you on the, the Realmcast today. We're so glad you joined us. Thank you so much, you guys. You can find Yanni and myself, Phantom, on the Mortal Kombat group on Facebook. You can also find Yanni on the Mortal Kombat Meme Realm. Special thanks to Uppercut Editions, the team behind the fan-made Mortal Kombat compendium, for their continued support. You can follow them at Uppercut LLC on Twitter and the Mortal Kombat Encyclopedia Project on Facebook. You can catch up on all episodes of the Realmcast on YouTube, Facebook, iTunes, and Spotify. Thank you.